And today on the bench I've got a rather fancy tape deck from 1975 to Bang & Olufsen BO Chord 5000. And this was designed to fit in with the BO System 5000 and all the components apparently are supposed to look the same so you could put them in any order you like. You've got the voltage selector switch here to make sure it's set on 240 volts and there's even a little tilt stand here. Clever. And I can tell you already the build quality is very good. This thing's heavy. <laughs> 8 kilograms. This looks a lot more modern than it really is. It look like touch sensitive things but actually they are just I think tactile switches under there. <laughs> just have to bend this metal. <laughs> Except for this one which you have to really press. If you lift the cover you can actually see some displays there. Dancing VU meter is not a great sign. I don't think you should be reading anything. That's just noise. And record level gauge. Look at that. I think that's just a piece of red plastic underneath. Promising that the display lights up but does it play? Well it won't eject. That's the first problem. That play. Well that's not a good noise. We've definitely got some mechanical issues. It's very helpful, it gives you flat pack style instructions on how to take this apart. Nice touch. There's this screw. I think this is just releasing the cover inside. And then the case screws. All little flathead screws at this age. What's well, a mixture? <laughs> Flatheads, crosses, everything's on here. I think this just pulls out. Oh, there's a spring behind it. Well, there it is. Just hooked on there. And the same over here. I think the sheer size of this just highlights how revolutionary the Sony Walkman was. Well, that's certainly a big mechanism. I can see why there's so much weight in here. Look at all these meters. Not an LED in sight. All lamps. Wow. I knew those were just bits of sliding plastic. I had a feeling. <laughs> and why won't it eject? It's having none of it. Although it will go up. Just don't see what's going on. Yeah, this linkage is supposed to be moving. And it's not. <laughs> Let's try it on now. I'm presuming this is a playback motor because I think it's a synchronous one which is very good for speed control. These are just to drive the tape transport I think. I think the front panel needs to come back a bit. So let's take these screws out. That shows a bit more. There's a lot of stuff in here for something that only plays tapes. I would have thought this should be um, more over here, like that. Mm, maybe I bent it when I took it out. Well, there's plenty of things in here to cause trouble. These old capacitors, these could be bad. Uh, also these tantalums. Tantalum capacitors have a nasty habit of going short circuit. And to be fair, transistors could be noisy. I've got my work cut out with this one. I think the best way to get the tape pick out is to just pop these screws out here, which removes the solenoid. And I can undo the tape heads, like that. Now I just pull this back a bit. Rather conveniently, they've made a plug here. Now this tape mechanism is really solid. It's got two motors, two solenoids and five belts. Unfortunately, the owner was kind enough to source the parts for me. Still getting from the bio parts shop. Well, the eject's working now. That's something good. <laughs> Must have been just a bit jammed up or something, or out of sync. Some of the belts are obvious from the top. You've got this main drive belt here, another rubber one there, round one that is, uh, and also on the bottom of it. It's fair to say the main drive belt is very loose. That's probably what the problem was, and maybe part of the squealing noise, because I don't hear anything squeaking. Pretty sure this cover's got to come off, but it's not entirely obvious how it comes off. This is so well made, I think it's just going to reveal itself. So I'm just going to pop this screw out here and see what comes loose. Um, not much actually. <laughs> oh, it has come loose. Need a little push. Just notice this spring's on a little rack there. 
I don't know if that's significant where that's put so I'm just going to put a marker pen line just there before I unhook it. And the same on this side. There's another one over here, again I don't know if this is significant. It doesn't look to be but I don't know why there's so many holes and choices. And this probably has to come off as well. There we go. So this should now lift out the way. And it does. And these are some pretty solid capstans. In <laughs> fact the belts fell off now. So a bit of dried old grease on there. I'll say dry. Yeah it is pretty dry. We'll replace that. Hopefully this just lifts out. Yeah. And this is for the tape counter. This is also somewhat slack. <laughs> Try and fish it out. I'm rather drawn to this flywheel design because it's actually got little notches in, like ABS sensors on your car. And in the same way, it's got the same pickup. Wow, from 1975 this was going on. Now these are out of the way. I'm just wary of any switch contacts, which may be somewhat tarnished. I've got this switch here, which I think works on this cam. Yes. So what I can do is put that back. Just check we've got continuity. And we have. Oh, these are good. And there. Absolutely fine. Everything looks quite healthy on here. It's all free to move. It's things that spin that should spin. Just going to clean the bushes a little bit for some IPA. <laughs> Not sure they'll go down. <laughs> oh dear. I'll try a pipe cleaner. Well, that goes down. No problem at all. <laughs> Let's put a bit of alcohol on this one as well. I clean the pulley on this motor. This motor is rather interesting. I think it's actually a three-phase AC motor, like an induction machine. That's quite unusual to use that on here. It's still a bit crusty, so I'm just going to just lightly give it a dressing with some wet and dry paper. Looks better. And whilst I've got this exposed, I'm just going to check if there's any traps, because there's always a trap when you do these from one end to the other. Because to get at these belts here, I need to get this off, and I also need to move this sliding play mechanism out of the way. And that's a bit of a trap because that's controlled by this solenoid here. And it's been squeezed up and I need to unsqueeze it. And I'm sure there's a proper manufacturer's tool, but I haven't got one. So, a little bit of persuasion. Well, to get this off, there's this spring here. That can come off, because this is just part of it. And a tiny circlet there. Go, it's tight. Bring it off a bit. And this side's even worse, all gobbed up. <laughs> they didn't want me to dismantle this, did they? Fighting me the whole way it is. I hope I remember how this all goes back. I've still got to get this off. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> so I think these need to come out as well. I'll try and squeeze it against the post, put my hand there to catch it. There it is. The same with this side. Question is, how does this come out? <laughs> it pivots. I think maybe we need to take it past the range of its limit here. Yes. Lift off. There we go. And there's another clicky switch there. Check that that's good. Yeah, that's very good and perfect. 
it's not going to lift up with that screw there, so I'll take that out. Cool. Time for a better screwdriver and get it to crank in. There we go. It's a bit freer, but I think this pulley's in the way. It never really clears that. Another circlip. Oh, that's another belt off. That pulley's out of the way. Take that round belt off. <laughs> this looks like it just needs to uh, be bent out of the way. Same at the other side. Aha! What's holding it there? Nothing! <laughs> that was a struggle. <laughs> at least I can get to the belts now. Sarah's got a nice action. That she rides on little ball bearings. That's really cool. Well, that's really sticky grease. It's probably be to help it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say a bit like a damper, but I'm not sure. That's probably just really old. But nonetheless, this round belt can come off. Oh, apart from it's stuck around this lamp. I think it just pulls out of the way. Yes, it does. There we go. Do have a bit of a clean. A few decades of fluffing here. I just discovered where that squeaky noise comes from. That needs a bit of lube, I think. Probably best to remove the motor so I can see what I'm doing. Four little screws. It seems to be a bit stuck. Ah, huh, there you go. Yeah, it's got a spring on it. Why? Can't see anything for it to engage in. Strange. Oh well. It's definitely a bit noisy. So I'll get a bit of oil down there. See if it does anything. Yes, annoyingly, I can feel it in this end. Where the brushes are. It doesn't look like this motor comes apart very easily, not without destroying it, so I may have to drill a little access hole. I'm thinking normally these motors don't have actual ball bearings, just a brass bush, so we'll try it. Oh, well that was lucky. <laughs> Gonna get me a lottery ticket now. Well that's revealed the wipers. That's a little commutator there, because it's a tiny thing. Can't tell if that spot's making the noise, but uh, we'll see if a little bit of oil helps. It's very light machine oil so it shouldn't interrupt the contact too much but it might not make any difference hmm that's a mystery I just need to get a bit violent with this I've got to get the brush gear out oh it's come out good 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 right hmm I can feel the buzzing I thought it's one of the this end, but I wonder. I'll tell you what I have noticed. If I put my finger against there just to lift the shaft up, just gently, it's silent if I let go. So I wonder if I've just got to put something under there to control that movement. Well, after far too much faffing about, I put the motor back together and found out that the bearing is actually an oil like bush. And I think it's just out of lube. I tried to trickle some in and I've just been running it with oil on there and it seems to be quite damp. And I'll leave it to run overnight. Let's see if it's still working in the morning. Well, there's not a sound coming from this motor at all. It's lovely and quiet. Success. And I put the other belt on there and just load it up. Let's try and feed this under this lamp is in the way as normal. Just engage that into the pulley and onto there. What is that ticking noise? Where is that coming from? Does it still tick if I go backwards? Let's swap these over. It's still ticking. Where is it coming from? It seems to be coming from the pulley itself. 
Hmm. I'll slow this down a little bit. Oh look at that! It's wobbling. There's a load of run out on this. I suppose screwdriver near it, just to try and gauge it. That makes it quite obvious. That's quite bad. I can feel it in the screwdriver. It's the same on here as well. Well there's evidence to say that this has got some play in it. That's rather incredible to take the belts off it. So I'm just wiggling it around. I can't feel any move. Oh, I say so. <laughs> yes, I can. There's movement in one direction only. It's sort of turned into a ham. <laughs> wow. I guess it's gone like that because of the force of the belts pushing it, putting it sort of this direction for five decades. I reckon it's literally worn an egg shaped hole in here. You can't see it though. It doesn't look egg shaped visibly. <laughs> right down here. Hmm. Um, this might need some rebushing, I think. To check this shaft size. Oh, well, two millimeters. News, damn it. Now, force down the road of the obscure parts. <laughs> These are sort of clock repair bushes. These will all be imperial, so there won't be any two millimeter ones, but something close, maybe. Yeah, this one doesn't quite go over the shaft. Try another size. Now this one. Oh, that's a bit of a rattly fit, that is. Uh, measures, yeah, 2.3 mil. Yeah, too big. So this smaller one that I like the look of. It's got an outside diameter of 3.55 mil. Let's see if I can do something with it. Well, from what I can tell, using the drills as a gauge, this bush is actually a 1.5 millimeter diameter. So I need to open it up through two millimeters. Now I've got these drills that go up in 0.1 mil steps, so hopefully just be able to gently open these up. It's gonna hold this bush in a little collet like this, just pop it over it. And just tighten it up. There we go. Hopefully that holds it whilst I just slowly open it up. I'm gonna do it all by hand. That's 1.6 mil. One 1.8 mil. Well that's at two mil, give it a bit of a test fit. Oh it's ever so close. Now one more. Try this at 2.1 mil. Oh, beautiful. So we'll just release that. There we go. Now I've got to open this up to be 3.5 mil or so. I don't know if that's an insert or something. Let's just push a drill in. So this is a 2 mil drill. Oh, yes it is an insert. Okay, that looks close to the size of the brass bush to be honest. Yes, yeah, 3.46 mil diameter. It's very close. That means I don't have to open this up very much at all. I shall just hand ream it. I know it's not a reamer, but closest thing I've got. That's 3.5 mil. Which is 0.05 mil short, but we'll see if I can get this bush to squeeze in. Looks pretty good. Put this drill bit through there. Hopefully it's uh, come through straight. Not all drill bits are straight. <laughs> I just assume this one is. There we go. So that gives me a bit of a hope that they're in line. Well the new bush in there, let's just try that over the shaft. It fits on nicely. Moments of truth. Although the idler is wobbling a bit. <laughs> I've cocked that up, haven't I? And I've just spotted how I've done it. Look at that little dimple on there. Oh, I never noticed. I put that flat on the drill. 
and drilled it all wonky. So I think this part's scrap. Oh, I don't fancy my chances of finding one of these for sale, so I'll have to make one. <laughs> Well look what we got here, twins. Well they're pretty close, except for mine doesn't have that silly dimple on it, or pimple, whatever that is. Let's hook the belt on and try it out. And this little motor belt. Now that's better, no wobble, no knocking. Great. Just put that little circlet back on. I hope I can just push it on with my finger. Oh, not quite. Let's see if I can drift it on with this. Yes. I'll try and get on with my life. Pretend that never happened. Before we turn to the underneath of this, I'm going to take this ball bearing out of this sticky grease before it falls on the floor somewhere. So I'm going to put a little bit of oil down these bushes, not too much, just a drip. Same over here. I'm going to clean the rubber deposits off these pulleys. It weren't too bad, but definitely a few little black dots on there. It also cleans any grease or anything else that might be on here. Back to the counter belt needs to go on first. Just poke the belt through here. And over this pulley here. Put the lower capstan in, and then the upper one. And put a new drive belt on the capstan rollers, then just pop it over the motor pulley.
a bit more IPA and just clean that old grease off there and same here and also clean it off these rubber pads that the caps on sit against try to engage this cover over the tangs now I can put the balls back in seeing that little bit of sticky grease and here and there this moving carriage for the head assembly that has to slide on here and it has to go under there and I've just remembered that it won't fit under the pulley well off it comes again I hope I can just lever it off I think it's easier to lever this from underneath yes Pop this belt off, just lift the pulley up out of the way, just pull that back over the shaft. Pull the solenoid out so it's nice and straight and bring the carriage down right on top of it. There we go. Just jiggle it to the left, pop that underneath. Same over here. There we go. Bend this tang back in and on this side as well. Then I can put the pulley back on again. Then put the belt back on, hopefully for the last time. Just going to put this spring back on. It's a little bit fiddly. And this third spring hooks onto the front of the carriage. Just try and crimp this up a little bit. That seems to move properly. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be a bit more damp than that. That sticky grease probably gone. This is the stickiest grease I've got. It's pretty thick. I'm going to try and dump some of this down that cavity. It's easier said than done. Wipe that excess off. Because I oiled the capstan bushes, which is a good idea, I do need to wipe any oil off the actual capstans themselves. That wouldn't be good to have. This is the perfect time to clean the heads as well. They don't look dirty at all, I have to say. But this is very good access. Get the pinch rollers a little clean. A drop of oil in the bush. And just push that over there. Same with this one. And these are secured with these circlips. A bit difficult to get on. I hope I'm just going to push. It's interesting there's no circlip groove on these. So it must be a push fit. Now this lever looks a bit awkward to install, but I've sussed it out. You have to feed this in first. And then rotate it underneath. And you should be able to flick into place. See if I can hook this little spring in here. It's the right fiddle. That's it. Now the cassette tray can go on. I'm just going to push these plastic things out of the way. And they're spring loaded. Plastic hinge here has actually got a brass insert. Like a little rivet that goes in there. Same deal with this push on circlip, if you can get it on. It 
just got to fit this little post on here. This holds a spring on it. This side's a bit more of a fat. I'm going to put a nut on here. Spin it through. I also need to feed it through here. Might be better if I put some pliers on here. I can just do the screw up like that. Then this part, hopefully, can just slide on. And then just spin the nut on top. Just make sure this is free to move, which it is, not too much play. It's going to drip a bit of shellac on there just to hold the screw in place. Some people use nail varnish instead, but I ain't got any. Just give this a little pivot, a little shot of grease, as it had originally. Now more springs went on here, which clips into this little plate, and then over this dowel. Same trick over here. Oh, it seems to have a problem with the eject mechanism. Hmm. Well, how's this supposed to work then? Well, that's not lifting up. This little arm's too low, so I'm slacking this screw off. And we'll lift it up. That's better. Hmm. <laughs> I reckon the mechanism's done now. Let's get it in the rest of the machine. I've forgotten how dusty it was in here. I'm going to give it a clean. Let's plug that cable in. It's a little bit awkward. Now this tang there has to go in the slot and you can't see it. And there's all cables in the way. Oh, I've got it. Just line this solenoid housing up. Goes like that, I think. Okay, that looks good. Right under my nose is this sticker mentioning DC magnetization of the heads. Well, that's not a bad shout, so I'm going to demagnetize them. That's all there is to it. And now I'm supposed to plug the heads in. Just get this into the right position and tighten it up. At least it's in nice and solid now with all new belts, no squeaky parts. The output of this tape deck is on this DIN connector here. So I need to find a socket, which I've got here, so I can get to these pins. Just hook a probe onto there, that's one of the outputs. Ground in the centre. And the other channel, see here on the right. Better move this spring off the board. That could be exciting. <laughs> yep, that one's quite safe there. We'll just power it on. And we can see the VU meter still dancing away. Well that problem hasn't fixed itself. And it's probably not a faulty VU meter looking at that. The output's rather noisy. Give it a dry test with no tape. Oh, we got noise. I'm just going to put a tape in it so it doesn't keep stopping. Let's press eject. Oh, it's still cutting out. Why is that? Try again. Looks like it's working. Oh. Hmm. We've got a pulley there. That's supposed to be driving something else, isn't it? Let's have a look at that pulley supposed to engage with. Ah, of course, there's a pulley here with a magnet on next to a hall sensor. That's how it knows. Oh, what's that in there? Pulley's full of crusty old white stuff. What is that? I've seen sticky old black stuff, which is old belts, but I don't think his belts turn into chalk or something. No. Oh, and it even flies off when you spin it. I'm going to have to clean that up. I don't know if I can scrape it out. Yes, I can. Oh, it's very uh, stuck on there, actually. 
I wonder if that is a belt that's just decayed. I've never seen anything quite like it, I'll be very honest. All better now. Well, I'll press play from underneath and keep turning this. See if that stops it cutting out. It looks like it is. Yes, that's good. Okay. What if it cares which way around it is? Clearly not. And if I stop, will that cut out? Thinking it will. Yes. Well, that explains that little mystery. And I've also got the belt, but I've no idea how you're supposed to fit it. So try some of the other functions like fast forward. That's good. Reverse. And play. Oh, oh no, look. Take up while there's not working. Just rewind it again, get that tape back to a, a nice place. Actually, I'm going to reject it. I'm going to chew a different tape up. What's going on? That's not sat down properly. That is. Well, now it's working. Hmm. Rewind. Stop. Play. Oh, there we go. It was a bit slow to start then. Oh, and they're still. I'm going to put some marker pen on the motor pulley so I can see if it's the motor that stops or the belts are slipping. So we'll play. Oh. We saw that then. And again. No, it's working now. I'll rewind. Play again. And the motor stops. Look at that. Oh. So it's a control problem. So I'm going to need the service manual. Unfortunately, service manual was provided with this machine, so this is handy. And this is a page about take-up moment, which is clearly electrically adjustable. So it's telling me to connect a 33 ohm resistor in parallel with the take-up motor. And I should disable the current limiter by shorting 6R2, a 3.3 ohm resistor. Well, that's the take-up motor, and it's connected to a plug that goes into this loom here. And the cables all seem to come out this way. Well, I can't see any 6R2 anywhere. But I found this diagram shows all the PCBs, there's actually 8 circuit boards in here. That's quite incredible. Presumably 6R2 is resistor number 2 on PCB number 6. Which is on the back of here. Hiding. And there's R2. I'm going to short it with this crocodile clip lead. I don't fancy taking the tape deck out to put a resistor across the motor, but I can put it across C10. Which is right there. I think I can just hang a resistor on there, make it easier to solder. See if I can just tack it on. Just going to bend it out of the way a bit, make sure it doesn't shorten anything. Right, next, connect the oscilloscope across the motor. No chassis potential on the oscilloscope. So to stop it from blowing up, I either need to disconnect the ground off that scope I've already got it connected to, or use an isolated scope if I've got one, or there's another way. The old oscilloscopes don't have any options. You can look at channel one or channel two or both together. But the digital ones can do maths. It does require two separate oscilloscope probes. Put one probe on here and the other on this side. And I don't need to add any more grounds because the audio output's already grounded to that scope over there. So I'll turn on the maths menu, change the waveform definition. I want to use dual waveform maths. And I want to set the operator to negative, that's fine. Subtract one from the other, okay. Create maths waveform. That's what we got. This line here is showing the difference between channels one and two. It says to enter the tape tray. Now to power it on. Let's press play and I need to hold it down. Definitely something wrong with the audio output on this. I think it's intermittent. That's better. 
Got to turn 6R8 all the way down. Now we're just 6R13 once we get it slowly running. About 1 RPM. That blooming racket. Then we just 6R8 again until we get the right waveform. Not the most stable thing. We're looking for a straight line, that's what's important. Now we're just R13 for a quick running motor. Then press stop. It's knocked the power off now, got to unsolder that resistor. So I'll take my probes off. Let's grab all the some tweezers. It's off there. And now it says I need to place a momentum measuring cassette in the cassette holder. Momentum? What does it mean moment? Which is torque. Makes more sense. And it just so happens I've recently acquired such a thing. This has been sent in to me from a kind viewer in Sweden. Thanks Peter. Stay down. Now I've got to press play and adjust the take up moment. Oh, it is moment, look. With 6R13. I'm going to get it to 100p centimetres. I've no idea what p centimetres are. It's supposed to be some sort of force. I don't know. But that tape measures it in gram centimetres. And as it's got a range of 0 to 100 gram centimetres, I'm a bit wary of setting it to 100. I think I'm going to go halfway, about 50. They don't mention it, but they probably want me to take this off as well. It's got to measure the current to determine the torque. Now that's some very strange behaviour. I don't know if that's mechanical or electrical. But I do notice on this reel, it's constant torque on there. Because this one keeps moving around. I'm going to put some probes back on the motor connections again. Well the voltage reading's pretty stable. Oscillating a little bit, but that motor's starting and stopping. Yeah, the voltage isn't disappearing though. This is looking like it's mechanical. I didn't notice that happen immediately. <laughs> I was looking at the meter too closely. I'm thinking this is a mechanical problem. Something's binding up. See if I can undo this. There we go. So I'm going to take my meter leads off. I'm going to unsolder one of the motor wires. Take it out of circuit. Just going to take this out of here. Put this clip back on here. And on there. Now I can drive the motor with a constant voltage and holding a pretty constant current. 0 0.2, 0 0.3 amps. Yeah, this is binding up. There's something wrong with it. Just to check the tape. And run the motor again. Well, that's running really freely on its own. And with the tray shut, yeah, still 0.15 amps. No trouble. This one's quite tight, but that's because the brake's on. If I just push that forwards, lifting the brake, that's loosening it up. It's not making a lot of difference to the motor current on this one, though. If I swap these over, try the other direction, see how that works out. 0.16 amps for lift the brake, 0.14, yeah, a little bit different. And this feels fairly stiff as well, lift the brake. It is looser, hmm. Yeah, definitely looser. Tricky one. There's definitely a difference between one side and the other, and I wonder if it's something to do with these pulleys, that funny carriage arrangement. I'm going to check it out. 
So that means the mechanism's got to come out again. I was hoping I wasn't going to have to do that, but this is a tape deck. It's not going to go smoothly. Slacken these screws off. I don't think I need to take them all the way out, actually. Just slacken them. Just unplug the heads. I can get this connector off. There we go. So I need to take the tape loading tray off, so this is a familiar job for me now. Let's disconnect these springs. Got to remove these posts as well, just remembered. Especially as I put shellac on this one, that's going to be a pain in the bum. Let's hope I can get it off nicely. Well that's not terrible, you know. It's a little stiff. But it is coming. Hmm. I spoke too soon. Let's try a bit more of a heavy duty bit of tool in here so I can keep a grip of it. Yes, that's off. If I can get this arm off here, there we go. Slacken that off as much as I can. Let's see if I can do the same again. This one might be easier because it's not got into the threads as much. So if I deal with this circlet, hopefully just uh, lever it off. Yes. That's one out. Same with this one. Just push these out of the way. Hopefully it'll lift away. Just checking these brake springs. They seem to be in the right alignment. And they just lift off when you move that out of the way. Yeah. I'm just turning this wheel by hand. We can see down here that this little idler pulley is in use. If I go the other way, it actually does feel lighter. There's not much between it, but maybe. I can't see anything else fundamentally going on with these. So that's a normal play direction, and this, yeah, it's quite light little bit of friction which is what you want, just a tiny amount. Go the other way. So that feels nice and loose on there. I notice this brake pulley here. It's a bit um, wobbly. Look at that. Let's undo this cover. Take these springs off. drive belt's got to come off again so I can pull this out. Yeah it's definitely feeling a little bit stiffer than I think it should do. Should be pretty much freewheeling. Let's take this belt off. Yeah it's made no difference at all. Something wrong with this assembly. There's supposed to be 0.3 millimeters of clearance between the bearing and the freewheeling mechanism. Yeah I guess there is. Now if I can pull the spindle out of here. Yeah I've got it. And this will all fall apart. And it has. <laughs> there we go. This is the right hand take up reel. We can see the rubber braking belt there. That's all good. Not much else to see on there. And this is the carrier for the mechanism. This freewheel mechanism. It's actually two pieces of plastic but it's been sort of melted together. You can't separate it. So we'll never be able to free this pulley off. But it might need a little bit of lubrication. And this is the round belt pulley. It's got little grooves on there, two little notches. Let's see if it fits nice on that shaft. Does it spin freely? Yeah. No problems there. Of course, this is the bearing. It feels okay. Probably a good idea to give it all the lube though. See so if I can get a bit of oil to go down that little gap. I don't want to put much down there. We ultimately don't want this going all over the belt. I'd imagine over the years of use it's actually just rubbed some of the plastic away, turned it into powder and it feels like it sort of gummed it up. It's 
I'll give that a little wipe so I don't actually want it to be uh, very oily. It's got a frictional fit, that's what we need. Just wipe this dust off here, it's like black dust off there, that's what's been rubbing for all these years. Same on here. Just going to line this notch up with a little keyhole. There we are, move it out of the way. Then just pop this pulley in there. That's all there is to it. Just slip the carrier under this brake spring, line the notch up with the lever arm and into the mechanism underneath to push the shaft in. Now pull that round belt out of the way. Yeah, get it in the right place. And just give that a good push. Just check for a little bit of float, yeah. It's supposed to be 0.3mm but yeah, it's probably a bit more than that but I reckon it'd be okay. Let's put this belt back on. Might as well tend to the other one whilst I'm here. Mind you, there's nothing to see from this end. Just give this a good old yank then, shall I? It's constructed the same way to find the little location. There we go, it's apart. Same thing going on there. And the same carrier arrangement. This one doesn't feel as bad, to be honest. It's still going to get some loop. So if I can just sort of slightly prise this apart. Just to create a little gap. Let the oil run in. Let's give this spindle a bit of a clean. Let's try this take up reel on the shaft there. Let's push it out of the way. See how free it is? Yeah, no problem there. Just assemble this reel into the carriage. Locate that key. There we go. Let's pop this pulley in. Put this assembly back over the shaft. There we are. Then I'm going to pull the belt out of the way. And the belt thing just fell off. That's not good. That can come back. There we go. Put this little plastic washer back on. It's a bit of a tight fit. Then the cap. And that's complete. Pop the cap stones back in. Pop this retainer back on. Engage it with those little tangs. Put those springs back on. In the right place, mind you. This one on the eject mechanism. Oh, I forgot the belt. Damn it. <laughs> At least I spotted that before I put it back in the machine. That would have been really annoying. Here we go. What I should have done the first time round. <laughs> Hopefully the last time I do this now. I thought about editing that out, but you know, it's all part of the journey. Now we can fit the cassette tray back in. Pop this screw through here, get a little bit of methylated spirits, just to soften it. I can pop the nut back on, and that should go on more easily. Yes it is. No sort of dramas on this end. A much simpler mechanism. Then on with the eject mechanism springs. Just wrestle this awkward connector again. There we go. Just spin it round. 
try and locate it on that little tank. Where is it? There it is. There we go. Connect the tape heads. It's like I've done this before. Let's see if I've improved it to push the brake off. Turn the power on. Yeah, about 100, 110 milliamps. That's quite an improvement. Let's try it the other way around. See how it handles reverse. Push that back. 0.12 amps. That's an improvement. What we had before 0 0.14, 0 0.15. Yeah. We'll try that torque tape in there again. Careful I don't push this in too far because the capstans aren't running. Yeah, seems to be working okay. We'll power it on. Now the capstans are running. Or we'll simultaneously start the motor and push this forward. Well, it's doing the same thing. I'm suspicious that it's actually the torque tape with its spring loaded spool sort of causing trouble here. It's not what I expected. I'm going to put a normal tape in. See how that goes. Well, it's a lot smoother now. I mean, to the untrained eye, that looks fine. I think I'm just going to connect the motor back to the servo control. So I don't think there's actually anything wrong with it electronically. See how it manages under its own power. Again, that looks absolutely fine. I think I'm going to start worrying about this and uh, carry on with the other problem that's just uh, emerging. This board's got issues. Now I gather this board contains the Dolby circuits. But I'll be honest, I just think we've got dodgy switch contacts. There's a few relays involved. And what do we see? We've got a big switch matrix here. These two here are operated by the record solenoid. These are favourites to go wrong. We've seen that before. We've also got a little relay. Not that little to be honest. Another sliding switch here. Pretty open. That could also be causing trouble. Although I don't think it would be intermittent. But look at this open frame pot here. Wow. That's definitely going to be a bit crusty I reckon. All sorts of muck in there. That's for the headphone volume. I'm going to unsolder the switch matrix on the board and get these wires out of the way because I think they'll be uh, in my way. Might as well take this relay out as well. These can go in the ultrasonic cleaner. The rest of it's pretty open so I can get it with the squirty can. Just chuck them in. And give them a bit of fizz. Now this pot is fairly dusty. Let's give it a little bit of a tickle with the paintbrush. It's going to squirt a bit of deoxit on there. Let's give that a bit of a whiz round. 
I'm going to clean this one in place because I didn't fancy unsoldering it from this flat flex cable being so old. I didn't know if it might melt. The contact block's exposed from here so you can actually see the contacts in there. So you can flush the contact cleaner straight in. Then work the switch up and down. Give those contacts a good wipe. Recording level sliders actually use a rack and pinion which operates these pots. Which have got some nice gaps in the casing so I should be able to get some contact cleaner in. Just work the sliders backwards and forwards. Just give them a good wipe backwards and forwards, clean all that muck off. I've rinsed the parts off from the ultrasonic cleaner, just got to make sure they dry out properly so they're going in here for a few hours. I've retrieved these out of the drying oven now, this relay is going to be absolutely fine, no need to do anything with that. The switch will need a bit of lubrication, so I'm just going to squirt a bit down there, just let it run down. I think I've got more of it on my fingers than in the switch, but never mind. And I should hear it stop squeaking. That sounds better. No squeaking there. Same with this one. Yep, that sounds good now. Let's plop the relay straight back where it came from. Let's line the holes up. There we go. Just solder in 14 connections. Won't take long. Put the switch back in, and this one's got to thread it under this wire. Okay, that's it. And this link bar slides over there. I've got to lift this one up a little bit. There we go. I don't remember unsoldering this red wire, I think it's broke off. Just tack it back on. There we go. Let's put this red wire back on here. And attach the ground to here. Let's see how it plays now. We've got nice steady traces now, no clacking or banging. Let's see how it plays the tape. That sounds quite good. No noise, it's looking pretty good to me. It's the right pitch and everything. <laughs> quite pleased with that. Let's try more. Technical tape. Three kilohertz test tone. Let's increase the frequency on here. Yeah, these are out of phase. I need to adjust the uh, azimuth. Yeah, I think that's good. 
Just even these two channels up to the left channel to turn it up a bit. There we go. Okay, we'll see how that sounds. That's nice and bright, Derby on. As expected, and out. Good. See how it records. Well, I should probably rewind it first. So put it in record mode. Um, oh. Doesn't feel like it's pressing anything behind there. Um, it's not. What's going on? And now comes to look at it, there looks to be a sticky patch there and a block of plastic in there. I just realised I've seen those before. I found two of those lying in the bottom of this when I first opened it. Well there they are. I did wonder what they were for. Now I know. Let's get this screw undone. Oh and there's a nut in the middle. Let's give these a little dust. And these. Now oh, look what I've done. Put dust all over the bit I've just cleaned. Typical bloke thing my missus would say. They have a choice today, a bit of epoxy. Not much. Let's find one side stiffer than the other with this. Way more than we need. Give it a good stir. Mix it all together. I'm favouring this glue because it's slightly flexible. I think it's had the right properties to sit on a bit of flexible metal there. Let's put a bit on there. I don't want it too much. I don't need to sort of go everywhere where it shouldn't. Same here. Just plonk it on. See if I can get it aligned. Same here. Just checking all these others are loose. No, they're all on quite well. Yeah. Before I put the board back on, I need to make sure these are at the end of the travel. And these need to be wound all the way back too. Okay. Get the board in the little slot, and down it goes. Let's put this back on. Let's try record mode. Oh, doesn't want to stay in. I'll just hold this down and press play. Ah. Oh. That is annoying, but I've just realised there's a service mode. If you have to go hunting for it, it's in the description of how the automatic stop circuit works. And right at the bottom, it mentions this. To prevent the stop function from operating when the tape recorder is in a service mode, the circuit board incorporates a shorting strap. A. Where's A? which must be lifted when the counter belt is taken off. I presume it's this dashed line here, right next to this diode on board 3, D26. Well there's a link on board number 3, and it's right next to a diode. It must be that. Better turn the power off though. Try record, and play. Oh. Still not having it. We saw the auto stop circuit work before. I had to spin that magnet round. So, I must have broken something. But I don't know what or where. It must be something I've been messing with. But we'll have to do some diagnostics. The first bit of diagnostics I can say is it's not the auto stop circuit because it's been disconnected. And it's got the same behaviour 
as if you were holding the stop button down. There's a clue. Let's take this open again. This is board number three and the keyboard lives here. This end we've got the take up rail controls and clearly the auto stop circuit. We can have a look what else is on the schematics. This is the keyboard circuit, they call it the electronic switches. And this is the auto stop circuit because this will be the Hall effect sensor. And ultimately its output comes down here through this link that we've taken out. And it goes on top of this transistor here which is shorted by the stop buttons. We should definitely check out TR4. And there's TR4 there. Just going to belly it out with the meter. There's the base and the emitter. 0.34 volts. This side, 0.65. Okay, no shorts. Okay, TR4 is okay. It's actually latched by this circuit here, ultimately by TR5. Let's check that out. Collector, good. It's an emitter. Okay, between the two. Yeah, that's fine. Let's check we haven't got a short across the switches. No, 11k. That's not a short. Okay, so check out the voltage levels on here. See if they agree with the drawings. I'm going to pick up the scope ground with this lead. Just going to unplug these test leads for convenience. Put the scope ground on there. And just put a crocodile clip on here. Let's connect that to the collector of TR4. Let's turn it on. Oh, minus 4.3 volts. That's already what the level is when it's stopped. Let's press play. Well, that's no good. That's too negative. <laughs> I wonder what could be pulling it down. This is a negative rail, by the way. Although it's at the top, you'd think it's positive, but it's not. It could be associated over here, but we already checked that transistor. It's not faulty. I really don't think it is. But where does this go? Hmm. Goes to OS3, an external switch, and it switches to negative 11 volts. That definitely could be it. Where is it, though? Because it's not shown as in the circuit board. If we follow the circuit through, we find R10, just here, and it goes to this brown wire. Hmm. And the brown wire goes all the way along this loom, up here, and ends up back at the tape deck. Well, that figures. I've been all over the tape deck several times, so there's a fair chance I've knackered something. Switch contacts here detect the position of the tape heads, and that appears to be operating. And it's got a brown wire on it. Put one probe on the brown wire at this end. Let's just buzz that out. Oh, no. No. None of them. There's another switch here on the tray mechanism. If we eject it, you can see it picks up on there. Can't see any brown wires, but let's just bell it out. Oh. Yes. Oh. I sort of done. These are all bent. That shouldn't be there. They're touching. I reckon I've done that and I've been rolling this cassette mechanism all over the place. Okay, power back on. Let's press play. And it's working. It stayed there. Perfect. Fast forward. Yes. Stop. Rewind. So where were we? Does it record? I need to give it something to record. Get the signal generator on. Let's press the record button. And see the VU meter is quite high. We'll turn the level down a bit. Or a lot. Oh, here we are. So I've got quite loud input. Okay, just right. We'll start with it faded out. One of its features. So hold down record. Press play. Have it fade in now. There's not much to see on the scope during recording. It's not that fancy. We can fade back out. And then stop. Let's see how that plays back. Nice fade in there, that works. Well, we've got both channels, left and right. And fade out's good as well. Brilliant. So it's finally behaving itself. So now we've got to find out how to put that belt on. So the counter belt goes from here to about here. Where this rotating magnet lives from the hall sensor. But it's not very clear how you fit it. The service manual, or at least the version I've been given, doesn't show it. We'll start putting the belt around the pulley. 
and see if it'll hook over something. Um, oh, look at that. <laughs> right in front of my face. So I should be able to lift this up, just took the cables out of the way. Let's place this over the eject handle. Let's nip this little screw up here. On the other side. And this one in the middle. Beautiful. It's a little bit worrying because if I slip and lose the belt in there, I've got to start all over again. Let's get it on the right end of the tweezers. And feed the belt around the pulley. And there we go, we're on. See if the counter works, fast forward. Oh, it does. Clearly got the belt on the right place. And it resets. Better replace that service mode link. Turn it on again. And check that auto stop mechanism. Place this cover, if I can remember how it goes on. Mm. The face is secured with these springs. Bit of an unusual arrangement. Sort of tease it against the tension. That's it. Put the little case screw in there. Then the wooden fascia. This thing's the last part to go on. Well that's it back together, finally. It's rather nice looking though. Look at that, 70s beauty. Well, I hope the owner has as much fun listening to him as I've had repairing it. Catch you next time.